Hi, everybody. Um, I am Amy. I'm sure you all know me. I'm PGY4. I've been around now. Um, and I'll be doing my Grand Rounds presentation on PRAME and its potential um, in mucosal and um, mucosal melanomas and germ cell tumors. So I'm going to turn this off. Okay. I have no relevant financial or non-financial relationships to disclose. Um, my objectives will be to discuss mucosal melanoma and its prognosis, histopathology, and molecular characteristics, as well as recent research that's been done. Introduce PRAME as an antigen of interest in diagnosis and in targeted therapies. I'm going to share our research on mucosal melanoma in relation to PRAME, and also share our research on uh, germ cell tumors in relation to frame. Uh, I'm gonna break my uh, presentation with four parts based on those objectives I just listed. Uh, so here's an introduction um, to our friend and also sometimes enemy, the melanocytes. Uh, they look like this on h &E slides, the arrows pointing. Um, it's normal to see these peppered throughout the epidermal layer at the dermal epidermal junction. So at the bottom of the epidermis at around uh, one to every 10 to 15 keratinocytes, which are the other types of cells within the same area. Uh, the most well-known function of the melanocytes are to produce melanin that will ultimately um, uh, protect the DNA that's in the keratinocyte from being damaged. So um, it's not entirely clear why melanocytes are not only found in the skin, but they're also found in these areas that are not exposed to sunlight and don't require UV protection, like the anogenital regions. Um, they're also in the eye, and then they're also in the naso and oropharynx as well. However, there are some theories out there that the melanocytes in these areas play a role in the innate immune system as they may have uh, the phagocytic as well as antigen presenting function. And they also have been found to produce various cytokines as well. Um, because we see melanocytes in all of these areas, that means you can have melanoma in each of these places as well. Um, I do need to mention that mucosal melanomas are very rare. Uh, in this article that was published in 1998, um, the author studied um, 84,836 cases of cutaneous and non-cutaneous melanomas from 1985 to 1994, and they found 91.2% of them to be cutaneous melanomas, whereas only 5.2% were ocular as the second most common location, and then 1.3 of them 1.3%, sorry, of them were mucosal melanomas. Um, so it's a very small percentage. And they found the head and neck region uh, to be the area that's most commonly infected um, at 55.4% of these mucosal melanoma cases. And this one I just thought was a good table showing the comparison between cutaneous and mucosal melanomas that I thought I'd share. As we all know, the risk factors of cutaneous melanoma is sun exposure, uh, number one. Um, but there does seem to be a familial predisposition as well, and the number of nevi you have do correlate with an increased risk of being diagnosed with melanoma in the long run. Compared to those, we currently don't know any risk factors that make you more predisposed to developing a mucosal melanoma. And as for the prognosis, without the stages taking into con consideration, uh, the five-year survival is around 90% for cutaneous melanoma and um, uh, a horrid 14% for mucosal melanoma, with uh, part of the reason for that being the delayed clinical presentation, uh, since they usually occur in areas of the body that aren't easily visualized. And as such, there are a lot more patients who already have metastases at presentation in the mucosal melanoma cases. These patients also don't respond as well to immunotherapy 
and they are found to have different targetable mutations versus the cutaneous melanomas. Um, for example, the BRAF B600 mutation has been well characterized in cutaneous melanoma, with it being seen in around 50% of cases, but in mucosal melanomas, they're not frequent at all. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, so clinically, uh, their appearances can be variable with um, some being more um, non-pigmented, some being more polypoid, uh, some being more plaque-like, and then some more subtle than others. The histopathology can also be variable with them having different, these different um, appearances under the scope, including um, a more epithelioid morphology, which is uh, the most common. And then you go to spindled, clear cell, rhabdoid, pleomorphic, and then there's also plasmacytoid. So there's all kinds of patterns. And then these will usually have um, a high mitotic activity and the necrosis is also seen. Uh, when mucosal melanomas are stained, they should show positivity for the standard melanoma cocktail stains like SOX10 or melan A. Um, S100 will have the highest sensitivity. Um, the staging of these tumors, they exist only if it's found in the head and neck area. Otherwise, there's no formal staging set in place by the AJCC for the other sites like the genital urinary anorectal. And um, in the head and neck, stage T3 means that the tumor is limited to the mucosa and the soft tissue immediately underlying it, regardless of thickness or greatest dimension. And then it becomes a T4 lesion when it invades further in. Um, so it's T4A if it goes into the deep soft tissue, bone or overlying skin and it's designated as a T4B if it goes further into the brain or into the skull. And um, these tables I'm gonna show, they're from a review article published in the Journal of uh, the American Academy of Dermatology in 2014, written by colleagues from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, it was a, the writing the article was an attempt to determine the molecular characteristics of mucosal melanomas, and they highlight the um, activating kit mutation um, as being one of the more, more commonly associated ones with um, mucosal melanomas. Um, and according to these tables, among the various articles that they looked at, the frequency of these kit mutations uh, ranges from 6% to 27%, which I don't think is that great, um, with the total being 14% of uh, 972 cases. And they had a similar chart noting the frequency of BRAF in NRAS mutations. And as you can see, only 5% um, of cases were associated with the BRAF mutations um, here. Uh, mutations in NRAS are also seen in cutaneous melanomas, and they found 14% of mucosal melanoma cases having that molecular genotype here. So three years after that review article was published, this paper came out in 2017 in Nature. Um, Probably nobody remembers this, but I did give a CP talk, a journal club CP talk on this exact article um, while I was on my molecular rotation. And it was novel uh, because it was the first large high coverage whole genome sequencing study of cutaneous acral and mucosal melanomas. Uh, I, I mentioned this too when I gave my presentation, but um, one of the critiques I had for this paper was the low number of mucosal melanoma cases that were studied. They only managed to find eight cases to study, which is not really great to make a noteworthy conclusion on that topic, but um, nonetheless, it was still a good article. So 
so it did corroborate uh, previous studies that were done since they found um, kit mutations occurred more frequently in both acral and mucosal melanomas compared to cutaneous melanomas. They also identified the significantly mutated genes, which means that these mutations did not occur by just by chance. And uh, for mucosal melanoma, uh, the, the one that was notable was SF3B1. They showed that uh, in four of six mucosal melanomas that all lacked BRAF and, or sorry, RAS and NF1, there were um, GNAC and SF3B1 mutations, which are commonly found uh, mutated in uveal melanomas. And then this uh, separate paper um, also noted that the presence of GNAC may be associated with a poor prognosis. And so it was not the first time that uh, this uh, gene was implicated in mucosal melanomas. Uh, so um, these uh, GNAC and SF3B1 mutations being found in mucosal melanomas, um, maybe it suggests a molecular similarity between mucosal and uveal melanomas that we don't yet understand. And maybe there's some more research to be done there. For treatment, uh, surgically resection, resec resecting these tumors is the best thing you can do, um, but it can be difficult to achieve negative margins depending on the location. Radiotherapy can also be used, but it hasn't been found to improve survival of the patients. Targeted uh, treatment using kit inhibitors have been studied, but um, in phase two trials of imatinib therapy in these metastatic melanomas, the best overall response was from 16 to 20%. Um, and that was studying not only mucosal, but also the cutaneous and acral sites. And that's just because there's just not that much research specifically done on mucosal melanomas because it's so rare. And also because the proportion of the kit mutated uh, cases among the mucosal melanomas is now is then more rare. Oh, sorry, we're gonna skip that one. So um, in case you guys, you know, were asleep and <laughs> just woke up, I have a recap for you. Um, so up until this point, I've touched on how uh, mucosal melanomas can happen anywhere there is a mucosal surface. I've said that it is a rare diagnosis and thus it's hard to research and there's limited literature on it. Uh, it's a poor prognosis, diagnosis, even with uh, surgical treatment. And there's not a lot of targeted treatments out there that are showing much promise just yet. There's variable histomorphology under the microscope um, and it stains with traditional melanoma markers. Staging only exists in the head and neck and not other sites and it already starts at T3. And uh, molecularly, these mucosal melanomas are, dif are different from cutaneous melanomas, but maybe have similarities to the uveal melanomas. So part two of my talk will be on PRIM. Oops. So PRIM stands for preferentially expressed antigen in melanoma. It was uh, first described in a 1997 article in Immunity, and it was discovered while studying melanoma lines derived from metastases. And uh, this MEL point B line of cells uh, had lost all expression of HLA class one molecules except for HLA A24, and they found that they could make a cytotoxic T lymphocyte clone that recognizes this HLA A24 that then lyses the melanoma cells. So this HLA A4 antigen is the one that's encode, encoded by the PRAME gene. And for now, what's understood is that PRAME is regulated by four upstream mo uh, molecules and then PRAME then exerts its function by regulating these downstream targets, which affects cancer in various ways, such that it can act both as a tumor suppressor gene or an oncogene. 
Uh, Prem is in the cancer of, sorry, is in the family of cancer testis antigens, or uh, CTAs, which are normally expressed in germ cells and cells in the testes, ovaries, placenta, adrenals, and the endometrium, but not much else except for uh, various tumor cells. And there's been increased interest in these CTAs uh, because of their tumor restricted expression, as well as their natural immunogenicity, or um, also known as the ability to, for the immune system to mount an immune response against it. Uh, the hematopathology slash oncology field has really been taking an interest in PRAIM since the antigen is not expressed in normal hematopoietic tissues. So they're really trying to harness it as a means of targeted therapy. And in addition to that, there's all these other cancers that have been researched on, um, including CML, uh, breast cancer, there's renal cell carcinoma, uh, small, non-small cell lung cancer, and then squamous cell carcinoma in the neck. Prame has uh, really also been a hot topic as well for dermatopathology for its potential for use in the diagnostic setting. And this article uh, that I have here by Les Cano and colleagues studied 400 melanocytic tumors to see how they stained by IHC. And these 400 cases consisted of 155 primary melanomas, 100 metastatic melanomas, and 145 melanocytic nevi. Uh, they saw diffuse nuclear positivity in 87% of metastatic and 83.2% of primary melanomas of various types. And they noted that uh, the desmoplastic melanomas were one of the melanoma subtypes that didn't really stain too well for PRAME, uh, with only 35% of cases being positive. Among the 140 uh, cutaneous benign melanocytic nevi that they stained with PRAME, 86.4% uh, of cases were negative. And um, in the 13.6% of nevi that were uh, interpreted as, um, uh, where, where the PRAIM was interpreted as positive, they, they mentioned that the positivity was only in a minor subset of lesional melanocytes instead of being a diffuse positive. And this is exciting because that means that this IHC stain, the PRAIM IHC stain may be useful in supporting a diagnosis of melanoma or, um, it could also be useful in assessing the margin status of a known prime positive melanoma. Um, another type of melanoma that has had a lot of research done with prime is uveal melanoma. And the practice when this paper was, um, um, was written was to use genetic characteristics to classify patients into low or high metastatic risk However, they found that there was a small problem. Um, a small problem, a small percentage of patients who were classified into class one were still showing metastatic disease. So there was room for improvement when it came to prognostication of these patients. And the goal was, that these researchers um, had was to identify different biomarkers of metastasis in the class one um, in the, in the cases classified as class one. And what they found was that PRAIM status really made a significant difference in progression-free survival as seen in this uh, figure here. Uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve is showing you that the metastasis-free survival in 39 patients uh, with PRAIM negative uh, class one tumors compared to 25 patients with prime positive class one tumors. And um, it shows a probability of metastasis of 0% for the prime negative group uh, versus 38% for the prime positive group. And uh, for just for reference, they did say that the probability for metastasis in the class two tumors was 75%. So this really, this prime positive class one is really in between the class one prime negative and the class two. And they conclu conclu uh, sorry, concluded that the use of prime in the setting 
could allow patients to be stratified into these low intermediate and high metastatic risk uh, groups instead of just a two-tiered system. Um, and I, I guess I should mention that uh, they did only test it in, uh, they tested PRAME as a M, uh, mRNA expression instead of IHC, but they did note that PRAME um, mRNA expression did correlate with nuclear protein expression by IHC. Um, and also again in uveal melanoma, researchers uh, tried to see if PRAME could be used as a potential target for immunotherapy. And they did an in vitro study and found that PRAME specific T cells reacted against four out of seven uveal melanoma cell lines. Uh, similarly, PRAME-directed T-cell therapy is underway for not only uveal melanomas, but also cancers like AML, non-small cell lung cancer, and metastatic melanoma. Um, and me most of the trials have passed phase one with an acceptable safety profile, and they're in phase two of clinical trials. So this is my, the third part of my talk on PRAME and mucosal melanoma. So current, uh, when you do a research or search in PubMed for PRAME and mucosal melanoma or a combination of these words, it yields one result and it's this one. It's our paper from uh, that, that we were able to publish in Modern Pathology in the summer of 2019. So before we shared our research, there wasn't any literature specifically on mucosal melanomas and pre myhc expression. And the goal we had for our research was to do a retrospective analysis of mucosal melanoma cases at our institution, of which uh, we had 29 cases total. Uh, we wanted to identify any molecular and histopatholo histopathologic prognosticators, if there were any, and then also study PRAME expression by IHC and see if that had any association with prognosis of these patients. And when we looked at the uh, clinical pathologic characteristics of our 29 cases, we found the mean age of diagnosis to be 67, uh, the average number of months survived after diagnosis to be somewhere around two years, and then the most common primary site uh, to be the sinonasal area, uh, making up 19 of our 29 cases. The most common morphologic pattern we found was epithelioid. The IHC stains that were most commonly performed by the pathologist to confirm the mucosal melanoma diagnosis uh, was S100. Uh, and all of them were positive for that. Um, others did uh, HMB45, tyrosinase, melan A, which showed positivity for most cases, and also to rule out other carcinomas, uh, lymphomas, and neuroendocrine tumors. Some people did A1A3, cytokeratin, CD45, and chromogranin, um, and all of these cases were negative for those. Among the cases that have had molecular testing done on it, we saw NRAS to be the most commonly mutated at three of 11 cases, not the kit. Um, uh, all 16 cases tested for BRAF mutations were negative. And so with BioNet's help, we were able to stain 24 cases out of 29 with a PRAIM antibody and as you can see, uh, PRAIM is a pretty crisp nuclear stain. So that's a, another reason why it would be a great tool for diagnosis and diagnostic purposes. For um, example, like we saw in melanomas, um, but that, again, that's after there's enough research out there that tells us what it'd be most useful for. So what we did was uh, we, um, uh, so that we could have a quantitative 
um, means of giving results. We used a technique similar to the H score for breast cancer ERPR calculations, where we scored individual cases based on the strength of the staining, as well as the percentage of cells that stained in that manner. Uh, these images here are showing the different strainings, staining strengths that we uh, used with the strong staining being scored as a three, which is this one here, a moderate staining scored as a two, and then weak, weak staining scored as one, um, and the negative staining as a zero. Uh, and that, that, was, that was the epithelial morphology staining with frame, and now this is an example of a spindle cell version of the same with a strong staining shown here, uh, moderate staining shown here, and negative staining shown here. And you can see these mitotic figures, so it's clearly malignant. Okay, um, all, these, all the stained slides were reviewed by a resident and, and a fellow, and the overall PRAIM expression score was calculated using this equation um, with the X being the percentage of positive tumor cells um, and the score ultimately ranging from zero to 300. And the mean of the resident and the fellow scores were calculated and then it was used for analysis. And if there were any cases with discrepancies of greater than 50 points between the two scores, uh, the slides were reviewed and scored with uh, Dr. Lee instead. So after we had the data, we had to analyze it. And this is where it was really wonderful to have a friend who was a PhD student in biostats, um, because frankly, a lot of the stuff uh, went just way over my head. <laughs> she helped us figure out what types of tests and graphs we needed in order to best show survival between the populations. And she also helped us in really putting meaning behind the data and putting it all together. Um, we used a t-test calculator to compare PRAIM scores against morphologic, molecular, and clinical characteristics of the different tumors. We used ANOVA tests using a program called R to assess for any differences in PRAIM scores among the primary tumor sites, as well as between sinonasal versus non-sinonasal sites. We used Cox proportional hazards models using the same program R to assess any association between PRIM score and survival. And then um, Kaplan-Meier curves and log rank tests were made by Excel, um, well, by me on Excel, in order to show comparison of the survival between cases with PRIM scores above and below the median, and also to compare the survival of patients between NRAS mutation positive tumors and mutation negative tumors. Uh, we found that only four of the 24 cases had negative or weak staining for PRIM IHC. And these were cases with overall scores uh, less than 30. Uh, the other 20 cases, or 83% of the cases, all had higher score. Uh, the PRIM scores were not significantly different between the different sites. And there was no difference also when comparing a sinonasal versus non-sinonasal sites. Um, in table two here, to the right, it shows more of the different comparisons we analyzed between the prim, mean PRIM scores uh, between the epithelioid cell predominant tumors and spindle cell predominant tumors. It looked like the epithelioid uh, predominant tumors had a little bit of a higher PRIM score but it did not uh, hit, uh, quite hit the uh, statistical significance there. Because there weren't that many NRAS positive cases, even though it looks like NRAS uh, mutants had a higher PRIM score, um, uh, it was not, again, a statistically significant difference, uh, but we did see a statistically significant difference in the mean PRAIM staining score between those who are alive at two years as opposed to those who did not survive to two years. And the same significance was not seen here 
um, for what the one year mark. And looking at survival in another way, uh, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves that I made, shows the percentage of cases that survived over a period of time on the x-axis here in months. Uh, the solid line represents the cases that had frame scores below the median, which we found to be a 202.5. And then the, um, the dotted line then represents the cases that had frame above the median. And as you can see the trend, it looks like the cases with lower frame scores, um, the patients are surviving longer than those that have higher frame scores. But again, it was not statistically significant here. This graph to the right shows a comparison of survival between NRAS mutated and non-mutated cases. And even though we didn't have that many cases, it did out actually come out to statistically significant increase in survivability of those without the NRAS mutations um, in their tumor as, co as uh, compared to those with the mutation. And also then looking at prim scores and the risk of death in yet another way, the Cox proportional hazards model showed that a 100 point increase in the PRAVE score was associated with a 170% increase in the hazard of death. And that was statistically significant. So this is a recap of our notable findings that we have had. Uh, collectively, cases where the patients were alive at least two years after diagnosis seemed to have a lower average PRAVE score versus the cases in which the patients did not survive to two years. Um, from this, we propose that maybe it's the first hint um, into the use of PRAIM as a prog prognostic indicator. Secondly, there was a significant association found between the PRAIM score and the hazard of death, which means that a high PRAIM positive tumor burden could pretend a worse prognosis in mucosal melanomas. And this associated persistent even after considering both the patient's age and also the extent of disease at diagnosis. Um, the, we use the extent of disease um, as our way of taking the quote unquote stage into consideration because like I said, there is no formal staging for these tumor locations other than the head and neck. So it would be unfair to just use the stage for the head and neck. Uh, so thirdly, we saw that cases with pathogenic NRAS mutations had shorter overall survival versus cases with no NRAS mutation. Uh, the mutation status and its effect, effect on patient survival has actually been previously studied, uh, specifically in sinonasal type mucosal melanomas and this group of researchers uh, that wrote this paper in 2017 um, they studied 66 total cases of which 27 had mutations. 20 of these they saw had NRAS mutations. However, they found no association between the mutation status and survival outcomes, which is not co concordant with the results we found, even though the percentage of cases really that they had of NRAS mutations uh, was about the same as ours. Um, some last words on this topic. We mainly wanted to get across to all the readers that we wanted them to do the same research as us uh, to corroborate or to con contradict our study, whichever. Uh, as I mentioned, we know the number of cases we studied is low, but we did the best we could with them. And we think our results are pretty promising. And they definitely contributed to the research for a cancer that has very little research done on it anyway, because of its rarity. So if we could have more institutions doing similar research so that there could perhaps be like a meta-analysis done on this, it would really benefit the people who have this really devastating cancer. And maybe it can lead to a possible prime targeted therapy in the future. And uh, for the purposes of any further research that we do at the U here, 
uh, we made a TMA with both cutaneous and mucosal melanomas in order to more efficiently study IHC expression with various stains. We already have some stains that we're thinking to use um, that are listed here, BRG1, INI1, BRM, ARID A1A, ARID A1B, and ARID2. Um, these ones are part of the chromatin remodeling complex that have been found to be mutated in cutaneous melanoma, but as of right now, there's not any research done on it to see whether or not these mutations exist in mucosal melanomas. Um, there's a potential that these, uh, the ones that are listed here, these molecular um, mutation targets can then be used for targeted therapy, which is great for cancer, again, like mucosal melanoma, where we don't have a lot of therapy options. And this is my last part of my talk. Uh, so we're on the home stretch here. And it'll be on the topic of PREM and our research again with it on germ cell tumors. So germ cells as germ cell tumors as a whole are the most commonly seen tumor in the testicle. There are many subtypes that exist, including a seminoma, embryonal carcinoma, yolk sac tumor, choriocarcinoma, teratoma, and then the mixed germ cell tumor. Um, it's very important to be able to make an accurate diagnosis on this because it impacts prognostication as well as treatment strategies. Um, seminobitous tumors are typically more responsive to treatment, so they will in turn have better prognosis as compared to non-seminobitous tumors. And in making this diagnosis, sometimes the morphology is enough. Um, if it looks pretty characteristic, characteristic um, but sometimes it's not. Um, here, this is an example of a seminoma. Uh, you'll see the monotonous cells with clear cytoplasm and um, lymphocytes that are scattered throughout the tumor. These lymphocytes are the darker blue, smaller ones. Um, and bryonal carcinoma, these are uglier. Um, these have uglier looking nuclei with prominent nucleoli and the cells seem crowded together and you can see mitotic figures. The, another one, the yolk sac tumor, uh, this, this one uh, can actually have various patterns associated with it, but this is kind of like a classic one you'll see uh, where you'll see a lot of cystic uh, um, areas with uh, cleared out spaces between the cells here. And this one's a choriocarcinoma. They will usually have like a multicolored cell population with these darker ones here uh, being the multinucleated syncytiotrophoblasts and then the surrounding pink, paler pink trophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts around it. Uh, the cells usually look pretty ugly just like the embryonal carcinomas. And then the teratoma. Uh, we might be able to see various types of tissues in, these, in this tumor. Um, here, there's a, a glandular component in the middle, seen here. There's some cartilaginous tissue on to the left, and then there's some uh, keratinizing squamous epithelium here to the right. So, there are, so there's those that you can totally tell. Um, and then there's uh, cases that aren't so characteristic. So you need stains that can help you. OCT3-4 is a good one to differentiate between positively staining seminomas and embryonal carcinomas versus the negatively staining yolk sacs. Um, choreos and teratomas. And then CD30 is good for separating the positively staining embryonal carcinomas, that's over here, to the, um, from the rest. And then CD117 is frequently used to demonstrate, demonstrate the positively staining seminoma from the rest. Uh, the problem with these stains is that none of these are very specific and they can be positive in other tumors. So a lot of research is done out there looking for various markers that may, be, that may better identify these subtypes. Uh, this paper in 2016 
studied prim mRNA expression in seminomas, GCNIS, and embryonal carcinomas in particular. And they found prim to be expressed in both seminomas and GCNIS, but not in embryonal carcinomas. Um, they, they had a little blurb in there about um, IHC staining and how it correlates with mRNA expression, but the paper was mostly a molecular-based paper. Um, so this paper uh, put forth the idea of maybe using a prime IHC stain to see what it does to other germ cell tumors like yolk sac or choreo or other mixed germ cell tumors to see whether or not it has any diagnostic utility. And that was how our next project pretty much came into fruition. Okay, uh, the title of the project we have is Differential Expression of Prame in Testicular Germ Cell Tumors. Our goal was to determine if Prame IHC had any diagnostic utility in pure and mixed testicular germ cell tumors. Out of the um, 132, total cases of testicular germ cell tumors that we found in our database from 2005 to 2018. We studied 58 total cases, 12 of which were seminomas, uh, pure seminomas, sorry. One was a pure choreo, one was a teratoma, one was a yolk sac, sorry, five were teratomas, one was yolk sac, five were embryonal carcinomas, and the other 34 cases were mixed germ cell tumors, so most common is gonna be the mixed. And then within the mixed germ cell tumors, there were 12 cases where there were seminomatous parts, uh, six with choreo, 13 with teratoma, 29 with embryonal, and 14 with yolk sac. So embryonal was the most com common uh, subtype seen in these mixed germ cell tumors. And also of note, GCNIS was present in 38 of these cases. So we were, we were able to analyze staining patterns for GCNIS as well. Uh, all 58 cases were stained for PRAME and OCT4. We wanted to compare PRAME with a stain that was well established in its use in staining pattern. And we uh, picked OCT4 because we thought it would be great in, in this case. Um, again, like I said before, OCT4 is useful in differentiating seminomas and embryonal carcinomas from the other subtypes of germ cell tumors. So here we have an H&E image of a seminoma and it's clearly positive for this um, OCT4 stain. And to the right, we see a positive staining pattern for this case with Prane. Uh, this one's an embryonal carcinoma and OCT4 is positive here. Um, but you can see here that similar to the findings of the paper I, mean, paper I mentioned earlier, the stain, the prime stain is negative in this case. And also for the other, all the other cases of embryonal carcinoma. This one is the yolk sac. as an ex example of a yolk sac that we had. Uh, the OX4 is negative here as it should be. Um, and um, here I'm showing you one of the cases that were PRIM positive. Um, out of the 15 total cases with yolk sac tumor, we found five that had positive PRIM staining with one being a pure yolk sac tumor and the others as part of a mixed germ cell tumor. And for choriocarcinoma, here's an example of that. Um, we saw PRIM positivity in one case. Uh, and you might look at this and say, well, that's not positive. Uh, and so it's that it's, it could be true. It's, it might not be positive. It's very subjective. We initially ca called it positive, but upon um, looking at it again, one might call this negative. So here in G, we have a teratoma. Uh, those stay negative for PRAME in um, all cases. And then here in H, we have an example of GCNIS uh, for which um, most of the cases stained positively, uh, but for GCNIS, we found the PRAME stain to be more difficult to interpret than the OCT4 uh, because PRAME stains the normal spermatogonia as well, 
whereas the OCT4 will only stain the GCNIS affected cells. This is a table that summarized all of our results. We found most of the seminomas stained positively with PRAME and all the embryonal carcinomas stained negatively for PRAME, uh, which we, we expected this to happen. Um, and then one PRAME negative seminoma case, uh, we did confirm that one with a CD117 and CD30, and it was consistent with the staining pattern of a seminoma. PRAME was positive in five of 15 cases of yolk sac tumor in one of uh, seven cases of choriocarcinoma. Uh, PRAME was positive in most GCNIS cases. And finally, we calculated the sensitivity of PRAME in uh, the setting of detection of seminoma in the setting of uh, testicular germ cell tumors. Um, this this uh, sensitivity was lower than OCT4, but the specificity of PRAME was higher than OCT4 at 93%. Historically, CD117 with CD30 is considered part of best practice recommendations to be able to discern the seminoma from an embryonal carcinoma. So I wanted to see how PRAME compared to that stain. And so what I did was I took uh, literature, I, I did a literature review of the studies with similar experimental design as ours, and I calculated the sensitivity of CD117 to have a mean of 95% and the specificity of CD117 to have a mean of 88%. And these numbers I found were pretty comparable to um, the sensitivity and specificity of PRAME for seminomas. So maybe it does have some diagnostic utility in distinguishing seminomas from embryonal carcinomas, although it might not be substantial enough to be used. We don't really know the reason why some yolk sac tumors in choreo cases stain positively for PRAME. And that's probably something that could be looked into in the future. Uh, GCNIS stained positively with PRAME in a majority of cases, but um, we found that its utility is inferior to OCT4 in identification of GCNIS because of the fact that normal testicular tissue also stains positively for PRAME, which complicates interpretation. So in summarizing all of the parts of my presentation, all four parts of my presentation, uh, number one, PRAME is a hopeful research subject for targetable therapies for lethal malignancies like mucosal melanoma. PRAME may be useful for determining prognosis in mucosal melanomas as it is in uveal melanomas. And finally, PRAME can be used to differentiate seminomas from embryonal carcinomas but its utility otherwise in diagnosis of germ cell tumors is pretty questionable at this point. So these are my ref long list of references. And I just wanted to thank everyone here and, um, uh, and others that I may have forgotten for uh, getting me through residency and also for contributing to me getting a Derm Path Fellowship starting this July at MD Anderson. Um, I could not have done it through and I could not have gotten through the last four years without all of these people's help. And just a shout out to Dr. Lee, Dr. Jubilino, Dr. Boo, Dr. Mean, who helped me mentor me through my research projects, my various research projects. So thank you for your attention. And I can take any questions if you have any. I will try to answer them, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, John Crossan. That was yeah. a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Oh, you're um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that melanocytes can be considered to be a part of the innate immune system. Yeah. Uh, could you expand just a little bit on that? And then the, the real question I have is, is PRAME involved in the uh, role of melanocytes as a part of the innate immune system or not? Um, for the, so for both of those questions, I guess, I'm not 
completely sure. I actually had a hard time finding why there are melanocytes in the, um, in the mucosal membranes. So, um, and that was just mentioned. It wasn't like something that's like, you know, exclusively studied mm -hmm. or extensively studied. So I'm not really sure how it, um, how exactly it uh, contributes to the innate immune system at all. So is there, is there any idea what the function of PREM is in melanocytes? The, um, it's got to be I there for a reason. <laughs> yeah. But they're not expressed in benign melanocytes, so I don't know what they do okay. specifically for the malignant ones. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Anyone else? Hi, um, I'm me. This is Ari. Yep. Um, excellent presentation and uh, terrific work. Uh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I just have a quick couple of questions on yeah. frame expression in, um, you guessed it, testicular germ cell tumors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So um, you compared uh, frame, um, it looks like with OC4, OC yeah. right? Uh, I'm just a little bit curious to know um, uh, why you did not choose um, cytokeratin A1, A3, um, because in my mind, that's more of a like for like comparison mm -hmm. um, with what frame is supposed to do in terms of differentiating embryonic carcinoma. Um, from seminoma. I mean, of course, it does the opposite. It's, it stains positive for embryo carcinoma and negative for seminoma. Um, so um, did you, did you um, not use that for a particular reason or? Uh, well, I get, we thought that OCT4, OCT3, 4 would be the best because um, like cytokeratin A1, A3 would be pretty nonspecific. Um, so I guess in that sense, we wanted to use um, more of a germ cell, uh, a marker that was more used for germ cell purposes. So that would be. In, in clinical practice though, A1, A3 is uh, extremely useful in making this differentiation as you know, because embryonal carcinomas are carcinomas and they're positive for yeah. keratin and seminomas uh, rarely favor positive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then my other question was, uh, in your penultimate slide, uh, just mm -hmm. before your conclusions, um, you were talking about the specificity of frame in, in dimension that, uh, um, yeah, I think the one before this, um, okay. the, the specificity of frame was higher than something, which, which stain was this? Uh, this here is Oct4. Okay, the specificity for um, detection of seminoma. Mm -hmm. um, but OC4, um, yeah, okay, that's good, I got it. Yeah, the sensitivity is lesser, but the specificity is higher because, I mean, OC4 um, is positive in both embryonal mm -hmm. carcinoma and uh, seminomas, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? There's a comment that this is a very excellent talk. I really enjoy with working with Amy. I think it, uh, actually I probably benefit more from her than she benefit from me because uh, I just gave her a topic and uh, she can dig in deeply and then then eventually he become she becomes an expert and no <laughs> way to go <laughs> thanks dr lee